Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. The first thing we had to overcome was the technology. But today we have <laughs> Car- we have Carlene Englade Cole, who's one of the top copywriters and direct response marketers. She's a master at creating controls. Everyone I talk to is like, you need to talk to Carlene. Lori Heller's like, you need to talk to Carlene. Don Hopman's like, you need to talk to Carlene. So when I was looking at the intro, you know, what I saw was on Clayton Makepeace's site, this is how he described you, Carlene. Her blinding brilliance rocketed her to America's top rank of eight copywriters in a fraction of the time it took me. In her very first year as a freelancer, Carlene raked in well over six figures in royalties and she has never looked back. Today, Carlene makes millions in royalties, creating huge multi-year controls for healthy directions, K. Wooden Associates, Health Resources, True Health, Boardroom, and all the other top health publishers in the country. Carlene, thank you so much for joining me. Wow, I have to I have to pay Clayton a little extra, you know, for that wonderful thing. <laughs> for <laughs> sure. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm so excited to talk to you. What's worked, what hasn't worked, and about your journey. And the first thing I want to I always like to include a fun fact. And before we get into some of the meat of everything, um, what's a fun fact? You have a stupid human trick. <laughs> Yes, I um, I guess my most what I'm most proud of is my stupid human trick because I keep waiting to get on David Letterman. Um, probably not gonna happen, but if I could, I I can um, write backwards with my left hand. That is, and a... I mean, I can write for days backwards with my left hand, and this is this is fast. I can write with with my right hand. Backwards. I think that 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 came from when I was um. When I was young, I was I was living in Haiti. I was born in Haiti and lived there till I was about six years old. But we went to um, to uh, Catholic schools with the nuns, and I was left-handed, completely left-handed. But they refused to let me be left-handed, mm. and so I had to like um, they had to t- the nuns would tie my hand, my left hand behind my back, really, and they forced me to write with my right hand. And if I use my left hand, you get slapped with the ruler. I mean, anybody who's I have I've told this story to so many people, and there's always somebody in the audience going. Oh my goodness, the same thing happened to me, but it was in Colombia or in Ecuador or some other country besides Haiti. So I know that's a rampant thing that was happening to my generation. Anyway, so I was, I'm was i a forced righty. I do write with my right hand now by force, but I'm left-handed in everything else I do in life. Uh, so I just think that kind of came about me, you know, writing with my left hand, but not being able to. And I just would sneak around writing writing it backwards so now I can just to have fun with it and whereas I wasn't allowed to do it so anyway I'm very proud of that by the way I think David Letterman would be too if you let me on his show I mean you've been on I mean I'm not going to go into this but you've definitely been in on the Dr. Oz show which I saw on your site and we'll talk about how Oprah has come into your life as well um, okay. but tell me about what was the influence of you you know growing up in that strict school how did it influence you yeah, well, I mean, I was only, we started school when I was four years, you know, in Haiti, you start school at four years old. And I was only there till I was six because we mm-hmm. moved to the United States at the age of six. But those two years, you know, it was just what you did. You went to, you know, you went to school. But if you happen to be left handed, that was sinister. You know, that was defiance. That was the sign of the devil, whatever it was that, you know, was tied into it. And so they figured they could break you from that you know, that, that stubbornness or whatever. Well, honestly, it, it made me stronger, I think, because I remember, I think I was probably five or almost six years old and we were being tested in, in school. And so all of the, um, you know, we had time tests and all of the kids were, were, were taking the test. Well, remember, they tied my left hand behind my back so I couldn't write with my left hand. So I'm trying to take a test with my right hand, which is not normal for me. And so I'm taking him, taking it. Well, guess what? I don't finish the test on time. So I remember my, the teacher telling my mother, my grandmother, ha- calling them to the school and telling them that they think I'm retarded or some mentally oh, challenged wow. or something because I didn't come close to doing what the other kids at my level were able to do. And so, you know, my mom knew I, there was nothing wrong with me. My grandmother knew there was nothing wrong with me, you know, but they're like, well, her scores were terrible, you know. And so they're asking me, like, what's going on or whatever. And, you know, I think that's kind of when it came out where I'm like, well, they're making me write with my right hand. I can't write with my right hand. I write with my left hand, you know. And so when I took the test again, 
I aced it, you know, whatever it was, it, I did it great with my left hand, but they wouldn't allow that to be included because it was with my left hand. Interesting. So, you know, what I learned, I think at that very early age was, okay, how do, how do I get what I want? You know, and what I wanted to do was I, I needed to be able to get this stuff done, you know? So I learned to write with my right hand, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was it. But at the same time, my creativity, I was like, but I'm not going to stop using my left hand. So Anytime, anything else, I had no choice. I, I'm terrible with my right hand, except that I have mastered penmanship with it. If I had to give up one hand right at this moment, it would be my right hand. <laughs> I'd sacrifice that one because I need my left hand. So it just kind of taught me to say, you know, hmm, you know, I, I'm trying to get to this point. How do I get there? You know, the best way I can. This is at five or six years old. I'm thinking this, you know, but fine. I'll write with my right hand, but that's not who I am, you know, so. I don't know. I think somehow it must have it put some short circuits in my head because I, I, I've been able to kind of see things a little bit both ways at times because I'm forcing myself to do things out of my comfort zone. Yeah. But that's a story for like the, you know, my psychiatrist one day when I sit there trying to figure out who I am and where did I go wrong in life? <laughs> or right in life. Or right in life. Yeah. Or left and right. Uh, so what was it like then growing up in the States once you got here? Um, a totally, I remember, you know, we moved to the United States, but my, my mom, my sister's four years older than I am. So my, my mom and my, my sister and I stayed behind. My mother married my stepfather when I was four years old. Um, and they moved to the United States and here they were, didn't speak in English, trying to make a way uh, for us. It took two years for them to be able to afford to bring us to the United States. Wow. And I remember it was in January, um, when I guess it was a very, very cold January. And now you live in a, in a tropical island and you, you know, my mom tells my grandmother, it's cold here, it's very cold here. So my grandmother's thinking, oh, it's cold. What is that, you know, I don't know what she means by cold, maybe, maybe 75 degrees instead of 90 degrees, right. you know? And so I remember we had these really thin dresses on and my grandmother said, oh, your mother said it's cold there. So she shoved newspaper under our dresses for insulation. So we go on, we get on a plane and we, we flew on the plane with, I think it was a family friend. She was a family friend who, who was coming at the same time. So she was to bring my sister and I on, um, on the airplane in January. My mom was going to have coats waiting for us, but we had no coats. And I remember just shivering because we're wearing these little, this little chiffon dresses, like we're going to church or something with, you know, and the newspaper shoved under our dresses for insulation and we're walking. And then I see this massive thing that these, it looks like steps, but they're moving. And I was like, you know, freaking out going, what in the world is this thing here? And I was not going to get on it. You know, I'd never seen an escalator my whole life before. And they kept saying, it's okay, it's okay. I'm like, no. I kept saying it was I, like I wasn't getting on. And I remember the pilot of the plane had to come and literally he picked me up. I, I, for some reason, I trusted him because no one was getting me to go on those th you know, steps. Another hard-headedness, I think, in my early life that has been definitely proven to be a, a benefit for me in my, in my, uh, my future. Um, so finally, I trusted this pilot enough that he literally picked me up and he took me up the escalator so I can start my new life in this new country. And so from there, we didn't speak any English at all. I mean, we spoke Creole at home and I was learning French in school. That was it. And just, you know, within a course of, I mean, by, by the time I finished first grade, so it was January, so first grade already started, by, the, by, by August, I was fluent in English. You wow, know? really? I, I, I knew it. I, I didn't need to take any more, cl you know, classes and stuff. I absorbed myself watching TV or whatever. We picked up the language very quickly and didn't want to speak the Creole or the French anymore. That was it. And so I just became very adaptable, I think, at a very young age because of the fact that we were put into situations where we had to adapt. Mm -hmm. So how did the hard-headedness, Carleen, help you in your copywriting career? Um, you know, you got to be, you got to be determined to do stuff. I mean, you know, you're knocking on doors that people aren't answering, trying to get your chance, a break, trying to write copy. You know, you're trying to position yourself in a way that makes you unique to other people who have a lot more experience than you do. So you've just got to be hard headed enough to say, I want to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to make this work. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, you know, and then, you know, when you get knocked down because you write a, a package that you think is great and it bombs, you know, you got to get back up again at the point of saying, no, I'm not giving up, you know. So that mm -hmm. stubbornness, I think, from a very young age 
has has definitely been instrumental in helping me to stick with this. Yeah. So what did the early days of your career look like? Where did you start? Of my copywriting career? Yeah. Well, you know, I had this this vision of grandeur in my head in the sense that I was going to start my business. You know, I, I had decided to quit. My husband and I talked about it, you know, about me quitting my job. And I was making really good money mm. working for a publishing company, Phil's Publishing at the time. I was doing really well, but I was coming into a crossroads where at this point I had four children. Wow. And I want to spend time with my kids, but yet my job was pulling me. To, you know, so my, my boss was complaining that I wasn't as work as much as other people. And my husband was complaining that I wasn't at home. I w- and so I'm going, well, where the heck am I? If I'm not at work, I'm not at home. You know, so it was a, it was a <laughs> time tough. to make. <laughs> yeah, I'm stuck. Um, so it was a time to make a change. And we talked about it and, and said, OK, not, and then what would it take for me to be comfortable enough to quit my job and really go after this? Because by then I, I knew that. Um, Copywriting was something that I wanted to try, and I had done a little bit of it, but I didn't necessarily have a lot of successes. What were, so, what were you doing yeah, at work at that time? What were you doing at work? So it was one of those. Say it again. Uh, what were you doing at work at that time? Um. Oh my goodness! I started at this publishing company where I started in customer service department, and I took the job only because the um the ad said flexible schedule. You know, and it was close to home, flexible schedule. That's how I kind of got thrown into the whole direct mail business in general. And I took the job um, and it was part time. And the reason I wanted it was because my husband's a firefighter and he had that 24 hour, 72 hours. hour shift. Yeah. Yeah. So I needed a job that would let me work on the days that he was home and I would work on the days that he would work. So I have to work like three days a week, but it would change depending on his schedule. So I needed flexible hours. And that job promised that they could deliver that. And so I took it. And that was the best thing I could have done because it was a direct mail company. I knew nothing about direct mail. I knew nothing about marketing. I just knew it had a flexible schedule and I needed that. At the time, I just had my second daughter. She was a year old. So I had two girls, you know, two and a half and one, and just wanted to find something with a flexible schedule. And from there, you know, I got into the company and they started learning about direct mail to customer service. I went to accounting, from accounting. They were about to launch this whole health division. I knew nothing about it, but I liked health. Talk my way. I can talk my way into a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> but um, I talked my way into getting a job in the marketing department with no experience. And from there, I was from a marketing assistant, assistant marketing manager, marketing um, senior marketing manager, marketing director. And that's where I was at this point. I was a marketing director. I was already making six figure income um, and it was a good job. You know, it was a good job. And I thought, wow, okay. The only problem is it sucked my life. It sucked my time, you know, and I, I wanted my time to be able to spend with my kids and, and, yeah. and do more things. So that was the road we decided. We looked at it and we said, okay, what can we get rid of and, you know, cut back? So if I decide to go try this copywriting thing, that the pressure is off of me to have to you know, make a certain amount of money. You know, I figured if I could make half my salary, you know, with copywriting, I'll be happy because I don't have to commute anymore. I don't have to worry about buying clothes, you know, the suits and everything. I don't have to go out and buy lunches because I'll be working from home. And so a lot of expenses would go down just because I don't need to have them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we figured, and then we're going to pay off the car and we're going to get rid of all these debts so that, again, we, we drop our expenses so we didn't have to make as much. And so we, we talked it out, worked it out, and um, talked to my boss and agreed that I would stay on until the end of December. He knew I was going to leave. So January 1st was my what I call my Independence Day. January 1st, 1999 was when I said, I'm going to be a copywriter. I'm starting my business. Yes. So January 1st, I come downstairs and I'm ready to start working. And then it just dawns on me is that nobody works on January 1st. It's a stupid holiday. Why am I working on January 1st? <laughs> because I couldn't call anybody. I couldn't do anything, you know, as far as prospects were concerned. I didn't have any clients. So I thought, well, my first day at work, I'm taking the day off and starting on January 2nd. <laughs> I'm serious. It didn't even dawn on me that that was New Year's Day. I was just so excited yeah. about this is it. The new start, new life, new this, everything, you know. Yeah. And I got one year left in this in this millennium. And if it doesn't work out, well, the next millennium, I'll do something else. You yeah. know, that was my attitude. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's entrepreneur. I haven't had to do anything else. That's entrepreneur, right? You work on January yeah. 1st. You know, you do what it, you do I, what it I, takes to do. I've worked on every holiday since yeah. then, so might as well. 
So tell me this. What were some of the, before we go, I want to talk about your copywriting career. What did you learn working for that company? Oh, I learned everything. I learned everything that I needed to know as far as understanding marketing, direct marketing, people. It was the best experience I had um, for the company because, first of all, Tom Phillips, the owner of the company, was a, an entrepreneurial genius. Um, just very willing to give everyone a try. I mean, the fact that I started off in customer service, didn't have accounting skills, I went to the accounting department, didn't have marketing skills, they still gave me a chance in the marketing department. It was one of those things where you just, if, if you had that entrepreneurial spirit, they wanted that. They want, The company was mm -hmm. young, it was growing. If you had an idea, it wasn't, hey, I have an idea, because if you had it, they're going to say, do it. You know, so it wasn't just to throw the idea for somebody else to take it on. It was like, no, you own it and you make it happen. So that was awesome. Bob King, uh, influence, probably one of the most influential um, business per people in my life. I mean, the man, again, a, a sheer genius as far as marketing is concerned. He gave me opportunities to do things that I was I'm shocked that he allowed me to do that. And, and so what were those? I got to, you know. What were again? some of those opportunities? Uh, for example, we were working. OK, we launched this. Um, this this whole health group at the time with one newsletter called Cardiac Alert. And then we had tried another mainstream newsletter called the Scripps Clinic Health Letter. And that didn't work. And then all of a sudden we meet this man named Julian Whitaker, who back, this we're talking back in 1991. Now, Julian Whitaker was this health maverick who was willing to go up against the establishment. And he was he's a medical doctor who turned naturopathic doctor and was telling people, hey, the way you're going with this traditional route is not good for you. You got to go this route instead. And he was willing to buck the system. And so he reunite he unites with um, Phyllis Publishing, who are willing to publish his newsletter called Health and Healing. And then Clay, they bring Clayton Makepeace in. Clay Makepeace writes this promotion in literally 48 hours. He writes a promotion called Give Me 90 Days, and that promotion changed the entire health field. It was a health revolution that he started in a weekend. Wrote this package, we mailed it, had phenomenal results. I'm on the marketing side at this point. My job is to get the list to mail this promotion to, and I could not find enough lists to mail to this package. It was unbelievable how successful this package was. I think it ended up mailing 90 million pieces in about two years. Wow. You know, that's crazy. But that we hit a nerve and we hit it big. And so I got to see that. And then, then I was the marketing manager, senior marketing manager, and marketing director within a product. So I got to, we got to try different things with this. So yeah. it would be a situation where I was getting the list, um, you know, ready to for us to mail it. You know, I worked with my my marketing director at the time was was uh, Wendy Makepeace or it was Wendy Wendy um, uh, Betts was her name, and so she was um, became she became Wendy Makepeace Clayton's wife later on. But we were a team working on trying to get these names to people. So small group. Marshall Hamilton was our group publisher. So the three of us were up all late hours of the night trying to get these lists done to mail these promotions. People are just swarming in. So we're, we're like pretty much maximizing on the, um, the, the, uh, the U.S. market. So then one day I said, well, wait a minute. You know, we're, we're struggling to find names in the U.S. side. I said, but we have Canada. How about we try Canada? And it was great idea. Do it. You know, I'm like, oh. I don't know how to, do, how the heck to do this, but okay, you know, had to figure it out. And now we started marketing into Canada and had just as good, you know, success. Of course, Canada's much smaller. So where we, whereas we had 200,000 names in the U.S., we had about 40, maybe 50,000 names in Canada, but that was still huge because we were charging more money for the Canadian names, you know, and the Canadian prices. So it, that was another thing. Then I, I had said, we said in a meeting another time, I said, wow, we're maxing out, maxing out on the U.S., we're maxing out on Canada. I'm like, people of different languages got to know this. How about we try it in Spanish? It's like, great, do it. Ah, my Spanish is not, no bueno, okay? <laughs> so so we're, we're like, okay, so we launched Health and Healing in Espanol. You know, I mean, it was one, that's, that's the kind of at, at atmosphere we had. It mm. wasn't just, here's an idea. It was, Take that idea and give birth to it, you know. And so it was just the absolute best environment to yeah. be in because it was an entrepreneurial spirit, amazing mentors of marketing, 
you know, that I could get access to and just talk right there to them. And they're open. I mean, Bob King and uh, Tom Phillips walked the aisles, you know, just like anybody else would do it. So if you had a question or idea, they were accessible mm -hmm. at the time. So that just made it amazing experience that allowed me to kind of really grow and, 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 and feel confidence in my entrepreneurial entrepreneurialism, whatever. Never use big words. I, I, I'm, I'm breaking my first rule. You know, <laughs> why don't use a big word when a little one would do? You know, if I go get it in this. Um, and so taking that, it was easy to trans to transfer it into yeah. um, to copywriting. So and and my my little break. I'm talking about break. I'll tell you my break. My break in copywriting, and that ties into your question. Yeah. Perfect example was you know we were we needed to do these things called um, renewals when we would send out the newsletters. Uh, we would always include inserts to try to get people to either renew their issue or to sell them another product. Well, it got to a point where we were um, uh, uh, we wanted to do something to get a nice renewal boost in our in our, our existing files. Usually, a two percent response on a back end renewal is considered good, and so we would try to come up with a with a with a uh, premium to offer to our our subscribers to get them to renew for a second year. And so we were talking about well, we should do something you know, to help them understand vitamins better because people are confused about this. And and so I said, yeah, my mom was having that kind of problem. She was standing at the aisle one time at the vitamin store. She said she knew she needed to get some vitamins, but she went to go get some and she was totally like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I need. So she ended up buying nothing. She walked away because she said it was just too intimidating for her. Right. And so, um, so I was telling that story and then they said, well, we need to get someone to write this, write a renewal uh, letter, get a copywriter write a renewal letter to try to sell this stuff. Well, they're trying to find a copywriter where everybody was booked. And I said, hey, you know what? I'll try it. I'll try it. Raise my hand. I'll try it. And he goes, okay, fine. I wrote my first, this is my first promotion. At two, I still, oh, I still have it. Wait, I keep it with me as inspiration. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. I laminated it. Because it is just a two, one and a, well, one and a half page because the order card fits right in here. So I don't know if you can see. Hold this. it up a little bit. Let me see. So what's the, what's the headline? Well, this is part of it. So the whole concept was people getting confused about vitamins or whatever. So I wrote the letter in the voice of Jane Heimlich, who was the associate um, editor of Health and Healing, along with Dr. Whitaker. And it said, the headline says, shopping wisely for vitamins is as easy as ABC. Because I end up calling the product, the, the premium, the ABCs of vitamins, what do I call it? The ABCs, the ABCs of vitamins and minerals. And so, and I just, what I said, what I did was I thought I had been watching Clayton make peace. I've been reading his packages all through, you know, when he was writing back and back and back. And I was like, well, how would I write this? You know, and I decided I'm just going to tell my story that I told them in, in, in that meeting was that my mom was standing there just as confused to find something. So I started, I said, you know, dear health and healing reader, Michelle A, that's my mom, you know, wrote me about an experience. She said, she said I love reading every issue of your newsletter. And, you know, I decided I was going to try to take these vitamins, but I didn't know what to do. I literally stared at the shelves, <laughs> dumbfounded. I knew I wanted vitamin C, but I didn't know if I should buy it in capsules or caplets, powder or crystals. 100, 250, 500, or 1,000 milligrams. I couldn't believe how confusing his purchase was becoming. You know, I just wrote what my mom was was feeling. Right. Wrote this thing. They 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 took it. They said, "Great, let's just put it in there." Insert. I barely think anybody looked at it honestly because we were just such in a rush to get <laughs> stuff done. We put that thing in there. When they got the results back, this pulled not a two percent, but a five percent response. Wow. And so. Great, great, great. So we go into our meeting, our, our, our monthly board meeting, and we're talking about how things are going. And so Bob King sees the results of this um, this special renewal. And he's like, is that a mistake? You know, and they're like, no, this did a 5% you know, re, uh, response. And Bob says, well, who's the copywriter who wrote that? And Marshall, my boss at the time said, oh, we didn't have a copywriter. Carlene wrote it. You know, and he looked, they all looked, I'm like, I guess I'm a copywriter. <laughs> So I wrote it and that it worked. So that was the beginning of my, this is, this launched my copywriting career. I was love this that. Two page insert that I thought, oh my goodness, this was fun. I like doing this. And all I have to do is tell stories and, you know, and people will just like buy this stuff. So that was where the germ 
of my copywriting, you know, career began. And it took several years later before I actually did it. But I saved this. I keep it right above my shelf. At all times, when I feel like I suck, I go back and I look at this again and I say, yeah. I don't suck. I'm awesome. And Carly, <laughs> that's why I like video. Because without video, we would not be able to see, you wouldn't be able to reach on the shelf and show us that that amazing first campaign. So what was the next campaign that you wrote as the I don't know. copywriter? I don't know. I don't remember. I wrote more inserts. I did that because yeah. it was just the point of, yeah, I'll do it. You know, I, mm. I, I don't mind. I'm learning from it. And I, I would call and ask and talk to people, call Clayton or other copywriters and get, in, you know, feedback from them about things. Mm -hmm. So I just continued doing whenever I had a chance to do a writing project. I just did it. But again, I was still making my salary. So it was yeah. just an addition to it. But it was teaching me it was I was learning how to do this. So it was kind of on the job training yeah. um, that I was, I, you know, that I yeah. was doing. I didn't realize it back then. You know, but that's what it was. So anytime there was a need to write inserts, I just said, hey, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do them. And I wrote some other ones. I know one I did did 4%. Others were coming in at 2 2.5% like they did. But mm. that was the first one, and that was the best one I think I, I've yeah. ever done um, yeah. at the time. And and it was just like, oh. And it just reminded me. Every time I, I, I'm writing something, I'm getting convoluted. I stop and I go, what am I doing wrong here? What's the problem? I'm like, I'm not keeping it simple. I'm, I'm, I'm scaring myself. I'm scaring my reader. Go back to basics. Go yeah. back to ABCs. And I go yeah. back and I'll read that every time. Yeah. And I wanted to hear about some of the big turning points after January 1st when you started a career. But I have to ask about that story was phenomenal. Tell me about, walk me through what in that piece, the Clayton make piece, when you mailed 90 million of them, what worked? What, what was that campaign? Tell me about some of the components of that campaign. It it was a um, at the time we were just we were we were doing these magalogs, which so it was it was a it was a, a four piece um, sorry four color magalog. The, the Clayton at the time, if I remember, that first headline was "Give me ninety days," which was a transactional headline. You know, give me ninety days, and I will and I'll help you. At the time, we could say things like heart disease and high cholesterol and high blood pressure. So we listed, and I say we, it was Clayton. I was not on the creative side mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, I, I, I trust me, I've gone through that package many, many times with him and trying to figure out what made it work. But that first cover was a transactional cover. Mm -hmm. We also did two other covers. Where we called it Mean Doctor, where he's sort of pointing and and saying you know things you know to, to you know kind of let people you know know about the problem then we had family doctor where he's sitting back with his family at the time and like why is this doc you know this doctor's got some great news for you type thing well all three covers worked hmm. the give give me 90 days worked the best but we rotated those three covers you know constantly because we were mailing millions of pieces every month you know to the same people to the it was to the point where people thought they had bought a subscription <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, uh, to the news, to the newsletter. They thought the actual mailing piece was a uh, magazine subscription. They go, oh, I don't remember ordering this, but can I go ahead and renew? I didn't get my issue this month. You know, it's the same inside the guts was the same. Just the covers changed. We couldn't believe it. And that piece, I really feel that it was a matter of the right message with the right market at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, has always been the the wonderful triad of success, you know, and, and any type of any controls that I've had. I think I've, I've gotten the right message to the right person at the right time. Any one of those three elements out of sync and it wouldn't work that year back then. You know, the frustration that people were having, there was no other newsletter. I mean, there were a few other alternative newsletters that were out there, but they were so small. They maybe had 5,000, 10,000, maybe 20,000 subscribers, you know, and, and no one really knew about them because they didn't know how to market themselves. They had good, good advice, but they did not know how to market themselves. So with Dr. Whitaker joining Phillips Publishing, who, be, who were masters in marketing, and he was a master in getting his, you know, and getting his, um, his, his passion out to people. And he had a strong message. And then we had the right time to do this. So that, that, that was, what's was that called? Perfect storm, you know, where it, it was just great. So the package, he, he, you had a doctor who had a very, very strong, um, you know, positioning statement of what he's about. He had the credentials. He was a medical doctor gone rogue. 
You know, he's tra he's saying, hey, they're telling you this stuff, but let me tell you what that really means for you. So now you had this maverick ad advocate, you know, willing to blow the whistle on with mainstream medicine. And he doesn't care who the heck knows about it. He's going to tell you because he is sick and tired of this mess happening and he doesn't want it happening to you. So we got a passion, you know, going in here with a strong message. You got a great marketing team who can, you know, get that out to the people. And they had, had hungry people waiting to look for a leader. And I think that was the, the reason the package worked so well for so long for so many people. And Clayton was just brilliant in being able to bring that passion to the marketplace and with making it palatable enough for them to understand, oh, this isn't like weird science or weird, you know, witchcraft or anything like that. This is legit stuff that, you know, this doctor wants you to know about. And it was just one of the most awesome times in my career to be part of that small team, you know, that we were able to literally blow this sucker up, you know, uh, always. And still, you know, it's still a successful newsletter today you know, 23 years later, but that was, we were, I was there, I was in the in infancy stage of it and watching it and going, holy cow, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool what stuff. What was it so, selling? Well, it, it was a newsletter, it was a health newsletter, alternative health newsletter for thirty nine ninety five. It was selling actionable advice and direction. Oh. So he's telling you what, how you can get off of Prozac and take, you know, this other supplement or whatever, or he's telling you how to, you know, just how to switch from the drugs to natural, you know, remedies and how to go about doing it. Wow. Yeah. So with that, what's some of the best advice? What was the best advice you got from Bob and Tom? Well, with Tom, with Tom Phillips overall, it, 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 you know, he always used the word actionable information. We're never selling, we're never selling information. That was my lesson with Tom from, 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 um, from Tom Phillips that I, I think about still to this day was, if you if you're trying to sell information, you're going to lose because especially nowadays with the with the internet, there's no way you can compete trying to sell information where you can get it for free. And um, Bob, Tom Phillips took it to where it, we're selling actionable. He used the word information back then because it wasn't like the internet wasn't around, but it was always actionable information. It had to be what can I do with this? Don't just tell me stuff. What can I do with that? So I think to this day with, with Tom Phillips was he taught me to be actionable in whatever I do um, and not to be passive about it. And he provided an environment for creativity, you know, the perfect environment for entrepreneurs because it was like I got the seed money. You go ahead and come up with the products. So we would launch, we launched product after product after product because he had the he had the you know the wallet to be able to cover it. If he didn't have that, we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. With Bob King, that was just that was just being in the presence of a marketing genius, you know, because Bob would find ways to look at, uh, at every sentence, every word, every you know thinking, and and find a way to see how does that how does that relate to our market. He's always trying to teach. He also trying to teach me, you know, know who you're talking to, know what you're trying to do for them, be their advocate, you know, don't just try to, you're not pushing, you know, a product on people, you're helping them, you're giving them solutions that is going to benefit their lives, you know, and when you stop doing that, you should stop doing your job. So that, that's what I learned with Bob by, by a day to day, you know, teaching and, and mentoring that was, that I still do that to this day. I, that's what I tell people. If that's what I'm doing, I help people. I don't, I'm not selling anything. I'm, I'm helping uh, a good product get into the hands of the right person. Mm -hmm. So Carleen, what was an example where you saw Bob kind of transform one of those messages that was maybe okay to, wow, this is something that people are going to want because it's helping me. Um, he, Bob never did any of that work himself, by the way, he saw the vision and he told you what to do. <laughs> so, I mean, he was not, he was not a writer by any means. He never claimed to be a writer, but what he, but Bob would always do was if you, if you brought something to him, you know, an idea, whatever, he would help you take a blob of an idea and sculpt it into, you know, a Picasso or, or Michelangelo, you know, my, you know, like he's the Michelangelo in that sense 
Oh, I got it. I'm getting getting it mixed up somehow. I'll forget that analogy. But it's just the fact that I know what you, you mean. Know, yeah. You you know you would have an idea like like I would say, hey Bob, I, you know how about we like the Canada? How about you know we go into Canada? And he you know be like, okay, do it. Next thing will be now, how are you going to do this? To, you know, talk to me. What are you going to do? How are you going to go about doing? I don't know. Well, what do you need to know? You know, so he would ask very very, um, you know, deep questions that makes you think. Um, it was just I'll give you an example how deep Bob can get. Uh, when I was interviewing for this job of assistant marketing manager, again, I had no experience whatsoever. Um, I, I, I forced Bob to give me an interview for the job because at the time I was working in the accounting department and every Friday, every day we would give the green sheet. Tom Phillips loved to see the money on green paper. <laughs> so every day you would tally up how much the company made that day. And so I was in the accounting department and my job was to type in the last, the numbers that came in at the end of the day. And so we would keep it and he would get every day, it's called the dailies, but on Friday will be the cumulative of all of the monies for the week. And so he was very happy to see me on Fridays. I had to stay on Fridays no matter how late it was until the accounting department tallied everything up to be able to put in those numbers so that I would physically have to walk to the vice president, the president's office, all the key members that need to get that, that cheat. They were staying there until they got it. So if it's six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, whatever time it is, my job was to make sure they got the green sheet. If even if it meant driving to their houses and dropping him off, you know, for them, that was my job. So I kept trying to meet with Bob because I heard about this health group starting off and I wanted to be a part of it. And um, but he wasn't, you know, giving me a she was he was too busy and he wasn't giving me a, a shot at it. And so um, I just said, you know what, this is this is this is getting old. You know, I they're, they're running out of jobs for here, and I want to be in this department. So it was a Friday, and I was like, okay, I'm 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 doing this, whatever. I'm getting that interview today, right? So uh, the money was coming in. Now imagine this is a this is green, but this is white, okay? But imagine this is a green piece of paper, and it's a lot of numbers on here with money in it. So I, I get the money, I get it, I print out the green sheets, and now I'm walking to the, the various departments, and I make sure I go to Bob King's office last. Okay, he was going to be the last one to get it. Normally, he was one of the first ones, but I'm making sure he's the last one to get it. So I go and drop off everybody else's. They're very nice. Hi, Carlene. I'm like, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I go to Tom, to Bob's office and Bob is down. You know, he's working and he's doing stuff like that. He looks up and he sees me and he goes, hi, Carlene. And he keeps looking down. And I stood there. I said, hi, Bob. And he kind of just put his hand out like, you know, let me have it. And I just stood there. You know, and I wouldn't move. And so, you know, he kind of stops and he looks up and he puts his hand out, you know, like, let me have it. And I'm like, no. And he said, no. What do you, what do you mean? No. I said, you cannot have this until I have an interview for this job. And he just looked at me. And at that moment, I thought, oh, my God, I'm about to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. I didn't show, I didn't show it at all, right? I just stood there like, you know, it's like, this is a transaction here. I will give you this when I get a, when I get a, an appointment for, um, you know, a meeting, for, you know, at least an interview for the job. So he just stared at me and it seemed like a long time. He just stared like, like he was dumbfounded. And then he just said, okay. And he took out his, his, um, his book, his planner. And he said, how about Thursday at 5.30? And I said, here you go. I'll see you Thursday. And I gave it to him and he said, thank you. I said, have a nice weekend. And I walked out of there. I walked out of his office and I went straight to the bathroom because I was going to throw up. Boy, I can't believe I just did <laughs> But after I threw up, <laughs> I got my interview. You know, I got a date to put an interview. So... Here comes the Thursday. I mean, it was a Thursday, 5.30. And I, I used to sew. I love to sew. I mean, I, I, I really think of myself as a, a creative person, not just on writing. I love I love making things. I love doing things. I, I love arts and crafts. I, I love sewing. I used to make all my kids clothes. It was a an outlet for me, a creative outlet. 
And plus, we were broke, so I needed money. I needed to look good without spending a lot of money on my clothes, too. So that was another way of doing it. So I have these clothes that fit me perfectly because I made them for myself. Well, I had this suit that I love this suit. It was a green suit with the navy blue trim, very fitted suit. Everything. Was, I, that, was my, that was my killer suit, right? So I was going to wear my killer suit for the interview. And so I'm going there. Okay, so my interview was at 530. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I don't see him till quarter to seven. Because it's just, I'm just sitting there waiting and I'm sitting, you know, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to cancel this interview because I know if I cancel it, I'm not going to have another one. So I just wait patiently, patiently. And then finally he apologizes. And then he is interviewing me for this job, which is an entry level marketing job. It really is. It really is a marketing assistant job, but they just gave me the title of assistant marketing manager because I was maybe making a dollar more an hour than I was supposed to. You know, so they kind of justified it by giving me a higher title, but it was still basically a marketing assistant job because I had no knowledge of marketing at all. So I'm sitting there with the vice president of a company and he's interviewing me. That was the toughest interview I have ever had in my entire career. Really? I'm not kidding. I mean, I have interviewed for jobs as vice president of marketing, I've interviewed for jobs. That job with that interview with Bob King was just unbelievable because he would ask questions and he was a master at pausing to where you're uncomfortable. Or you don't know what the heck is going on and you can't read his face. So you don't know. And I, I, I feed off of people all the time. I'm like, oh, OK, I got you smiling. That's great. That's nothing. So he asked the question. He said to me, I remember that the question he said was, OK. It's Sunday morning and uh, you have a choice, you know, uh, of what things to do. He said, um, you can go shopping, you know, you can play a sport or you can read a book. Which one would you do? And I'm looking, I'm trying to think, like, what the heck kind of question? Okay, what? So I just said to him, I said, <laughs> wait, first of all, you got to realize I've got kids. So the concept of having a Sunday morning to myself is yeah. totally foreign to me, you know? So look, you did, you smiled, right? Most humans would smile at something like that, <laughs> not Bob King. And pause and pause and pause. And he's waiting for me to answer. And I'm like, I felt like a half hour went by, it was of silence. I'm like, oh, you still want me to answer that question after my, my great answer? He's like, yeah. And so I then tried another one. I said, well, I'd start off, you know, sitting back, reading a book. And then I'd say, nah, let me call my friends, get together and play a sport. And then we'll go shopping afterwards. You know, I try to combine all three. <laughs> nothing. I got nothing from him, you know. And then finally I said, he, I, I mean, I was totally intimidated at this point, and I'm just thinking, I'm bombing this interview so bad. I am not going to get this job. So what the heck? I don't care. My attitude and my hard headedness started coming through. So I said, you know, I'm thinking about that question, and it's really good. I really like to know what would you do, you know? And I just turned it over to him, and he wasn't expecting that, and he kind of stopped. Then he started answering his own questions. <laughs> And he said, you know, you know, he told me what he would do. I'm like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Now, why would you do? And I started interviewing him, you know, and we totally changed the dynamics of the whole thing. I got comfortable. I felt like I could understand him better. I don't know what other questions he asked me on the interview. I didn't care. I just figured, what the heck? I don't know if I got this job or not. You know, at the end of the interview, I just said, I said, well, Bob, back to that first question. I said, what what is the right answer? You know, is it going shopping? Is it going, you know, what, what is it? Is it playing a sport or is it, you know, um, reading a book? And he says, it's, there's no right or wrong answer. He's like marketing. It's about marketing. So if you had told me, you know, you were going to read a book, I would just follow up by asking you, what book would it be? That would help me get an insight on who you are. If you told me you were going to go, um, to, uh, go play a sport, I'd ask what kind of sport would it be? I then see if you were a team player or if you were a solo, you know, person, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to go golfing or you're going to go play softball, you know? And they said, if you told me you were going to go shopping, well, shopping is marketing. I would ask you where you go. What would you buy? Where you look for? You know, you know, so I was like, oh, 
okay. I wish I had known that I could answer the question for you, but you know, it was just, just the way, you know, he thinks. So he would let you, he, he wanted to know who you are and see what you brought to the, you know, the mix and see what kind of dynamics he's going to create. Cause he knew he was creating something major. And so based on that was how he would, you know, he structured the team. So I figured I didn't have a job. Okay, whatever. I tried. I walked out of there. My my awesome green suit with the blue trim was completely stained in the back from sweat. I mean, I walked out of there. My entire back was sweating all all my all the way down. It's like somebody hosed me down. It was horrible. And I, and the stain never went away on my my suit. I had to trash the suit after that. So I think he still owes me a suit to this day. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, what the heck? I went home, told my husband. He said, how'd it go? I'm like, I don't think it went well. I said, but what the heck? I don't care. And then the next day, I got a call from Marshall Hamilton saying, looks like we're working together. You know, can you come in for an interview? I want to talk with you because Bob wants to hire you. And I'm like, what? Pretty awesome. So that was, like I said, the hardest interview of my life. But at the same time, it kind of lets you know the kind of person I was going to be working with. Just a brilliant, brilliant person. I actually like your first answer of, I have kids. I don't get a Sunday by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true. I'm like, what? To by myself, you know, I'm like, oh, it's just too foreign for me. You yeah. know? But he wasn't letting that go, so I had to give him something else. <laughs> I like that answer. Um, so, Carlene, tell me, after January 1st, how did you get your first clients? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so here you think I was working in this field of, of direct mail, where I actually, at some point I was actually involved with the hiring process of copywriters. I knew who the players were in the industry. I knew the companies. I knew the board. I knew boardroom. I could pick up the phone and talk to high up people in boardroom because we were, you know, we were like, you know, competitors, but the friendly competitors. I knew Rodale, Rodale people. I knew all of the other companies that were out there that were the big, you know, industry leaders. So you would think, okay, great. I should be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, hire me. Didn't work that way. Um, so I knew them on the marketing side. But here I was now trying to be this copywriter, this creative person. And remember that sample, my, my little two-page letter? That's really all I had along with some other ones like that. But here I am trying to break in saying, I want to write some copy for you. So I, I didn't. I struggled. The first, first few months, it was really consulting that was keeping me alive. Because those companies heard that I went off on my own and I had all this knowledge of marketing. So they said, well, hey, can you come consult with us? And so I'm like, whatever puts food on its table. Right. So I was consulting. And so when I was consulting, I would then try to find out what their copywriting needs were and to see if there's a way I could kind of get myself into that to, to fill that need. So it was consulting. It was networking. I, I work with a lot of list brokers. And one list broker's name was um, Dave Nelson. And Dave worked for a company called Walter Carl at the time. And, um, but we, you know, I had worked with him and all, he knew me, I was, he knew I was reliable and all that kind of stuff. He knew I was going on my own, but that was it. And then one day I got a call from Dave Nelson saying, Hey, Carlene, I have this, um, male potency client who's been mailing really hot and heavy and he's doing really well. Well, he did an analysis of his, um, of his mailing list, I mean, of, of his, um, subscribers and he thought he had he was he was writing to predominantly white males and what he found out was the majority of his of his file were actually black men hmm. and he thought that you know if he could find a black male copywriter who could identify with his market hmm. that would give him a better chance of being you know even more successful so he told Dave well find me a black a black male copywriter that could, you know, help me do this. Well, let me tell you, when I was starting copywriting, uh, <laughs> white bread was the word for the majority of the, you know, I mean, everybody was, everyone that I knew was white. I mean, mm -hmm. once of one, one or two here and there, but predominantly it was a white male dominated industry. Um, and so the, the Dave Nelson's having a hard time because he couldn't, he couldn't find a black male. So he says, well, I know you're, you're half black and half German. So maybe you can help me out here, you know? And I said, of course I can. And your client is brilliant. 
that he's trying to find someone who I said I will I will have my friends and I will I will get this for him. Yes, I can help you get this, you know, going. So he puts me in touch with the um the the mailer at the time and the guy was thinking, "Oh, he just he just thought that's how he needs to go." I said, "Oh, absolutely. You know, you really need to do that and, you know, I I have black family members. I have I can tap into this easily. I I'll talk to my husband and see what he can do. You know, we could I said I, this is going to I'm going to make this work for you. Yes, I can." I talked myself into getting that job. He agreed. He hired me for it. Um, and I wrote the package and it beat the control. It wow. beat the um, the white male copywriter that he had. It beat it pretty well, too. And it was an established copywriter. And I was like, what the heck? I was so shocked because, first of all, all that junk that I said was total BS. I mean, that is not true. You do not have to be your market. You have to know your market. Right. I mean, I right now, right now, I, I write for 50 plus year old white males. That is 80% of the time I'm writing to that demographic. I have never been, except now I am over 50. That's it. I was never in my market, you know? And it's like they could never tell it was a woman, you know, or who was writing or a PMS or anything like that. They could not tell that I was writing because I, was, I knew who my market was and I was writing to my market. Right. So my whole, that whole story of like, oh, sure, sure, yes, you need that. Well, that was so I could get the job because if he wants to believe us what he needs, fine, I don't care, I'll work it. I'll be whatever you want me to be to get the job. But that's not in the reality that has got nothing to do with it. Nothing. In fact, I tell the story all the time was that for Essence Magazine, the magazine for today's black woman, the person who held the longest controls for the longest amount of time was a white male living in, you know, Philadelphia. So he like he's today's black woman. I don't think so. But he knows today's black woman. And right. he wrote he writes those packages. Right. I think he's still doing them now. So. It's just one of those things where, you know, you kind of double edged sword there. Yeah, I said I, that was true to get the job, but in reality, I had nothing to do with it, you know, because if I didn't know who I was writing to, it wouldn't matter what, what race I was, what sex I was. Copywriting is blind, I, I feel, you know, copywriting is about knowing who you're writing to and delivering that message to that person, you know, in the right way. So, the, you know, as a vehicle, it doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. So, Carleen, I mean, it's still pretty amazing. So you take that and you beat the control. So what was in your male potency uh, con uh, control package? What was in it? What was the... All right. Well, okay. That package was... I, I, wrote, I wrote the package and I was, I was extremely intimidated because I, I, I'm thinking, yes, I'm going to get all this help, right? So I told my husband, I was like, yeah, I'm going to tell him you're going to help me with it. My husband's like, yeah, sure, sure. No problem. No problem. You know, all the, my friends were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll help you with this, whatever, whatever. So I get the job and I go back to my husband. I say, okay, now here, uh, will you try this product, whatever? And he's like, I'm not taking that. I don't need it. I don't need it. I said, well, help me. What do you think? I, I don't know. I can't relate to these people. And then my friends were like, they were helping me like, uh, we don't have that problem. Because I mean, I mean, we're 30 year, 30 year olds, you know, for the most part. And so all of a sudden it was like, I, ha I thought I had this army working with me. All of a sudden, you they know, turned I around took one and ran step the other forward way. and they took three steps back, you know, right. and I'm like, I'm alone, right? <laughs> Where did they go? You know, and so so it was scary. So I started writing the package. I'm going, all right, you know, just little bit of a little bit. Who am I writing to? What am I talking about? What are the concerns? So I start writing it, and then I call Clayton. I call Clayton Makepeace, who is my mentor and and my one of my very dear friends. I always tell I, Clayton knows I will do anything, anything for him as long as it's not immoral or illegal. You know, you know, I got his back, you know, that's it, because he has just been a true friend and a mentor for me for we're talking about 30, you know, is it? Yeah, almost 30 years now. So it's just amazing. Wow. So um, you don't even anyway, look 30 so, years old. Huh? You don't even look 30 years old. Oh, my gosh. I'm 53 that's and about to have my third grandson. Woo wow. <laughs> You look too young for that, but anyways. Oh well, thank you very much. I think it's the it's the filter on the screen, maybe that's helping. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe all these pills I've been taking all these years. It's the health pills. Thank you. That's exactly thank what you it very is. Much. It's the health it. pills. <laughs> yeah, that's it. All the health pills, exactly. So I wrote the I wrote my first draft for the package, and you know I I'm not feeling good about it. I'm not. I don't. You know I'm just nervous. So I, I asked Clayton. I said, Hey, would you do me a favor? Can you take a look at this and tell me what you think? Give me some crits on this package. And so he says, sure, no problem. So he gets it and then he calls me up and he said, first of all, 
you write like a girl, you know? He told you that. And I'm like, but I am a girl. He's, you know, I'm like, he says, yeah, he says, you may be a girl, but that's not who you're writing to. So I had to like get out of myself. And he says, so I need you to take a day off. You know, he said, before then, you need to burp, fart, scratch your butt and adjust your package. You know, not not my copy package, the other package. And then just go take the day off and then come back here and write like you're supposed to write. And I remember going, fine, okay, fine. So I hung up the phone and I'm like, going, what the heck? So, you know, I go, I take the day off. I pick up my grandmother and we go shopping at Walmart. I just do all this other stuff to clear my head. And then, then he had some comments for me. He said, you got a great package here, but you're scared. You know, you're bearing, you're, you're bearing the message, you know, so go back and figure out what the heck do these men want? And you know what they want if you're taking a male potency product, mm -hmm. you know? And so then I went back to the next day and I, I wish I still have that packet somewhere. I can find it, but I think the copy started off some, you know, it was just so gross, but for me as a woman, it's gross. What was it? <laughs> but sort of like, ah, oh, I don't know. It had some kind of sex angle in there. I had to find it. But it was just, I just said, okay, let's do this, you know? I'm like, I'm a guy, this is what guys want, let's go for it, and I wrote it. And again, I wish I had it, I I, I would. I know I have it, I just have to find it, because I have on um, here, I keep a, I, I keep at least two samples of everything I've ever written from day one of Cold Marketing Solutions, my company. So I know I have in binder number one, because it would be there, but I don't wanna take up your time to look for it, but it was the equivalent of just, Getting, getting to the point with the I guy wanna, wants. I want to hear what, what it was, that opening. Do you remember right. what the headline was? Yeah, well, hold on. Let me see. Yeah. Um, 26, 27. Where is my book one? 15, 6, 3. Two. Oh, my gosh. If you want me to find it, it's probably in that book right there. Yeah, Let me I get, get it. it. Yeah, I get it. All right, hold yeah. on. Ugh. Oh, my gosh. I got to get on a chair. This is real life <laughs> happening here. That's why I, yeah, do no editing and. Ah, okay. I think it should be in this book. Oh, man, I haven't been like in years. I have these binders. And. Whew, that's a lot of dust. <laughs> ah, is this it? I think this is it. Yes, here it is. Okay, um, so we're talking this version, spring of 2000. Hold on, if you can see this. I keep my little stickies on here. Um, looks great. Comment from the copy, Carlene, more to come. Looks great, huh? So I saved my little notes in here. But this is the package. I'm sorry, this is how my dust just flew off my face. Okay, I got to clean better. All right, can you see this? I can see it, yeah. Okay, it says, uh, it's called Peak Potentials Alliances, Inc., Healthy Sex and Living, the magazine of vibrant life and loving for men over 40. That's, that's what I made it look like as a, as a magazine. Invigorate your sex life, nature's remarkable secret for sizzling sex performance after age 40. Yeah. So my letter starts off, <clears throat> the following is a true story. It contains sensitive material of a sexual nature. Uh, and it says, take it from me, this all natural Viagra can save your sex life. Nature's remarkable secret for sizzling sexual performance after age 40 is safer, cheaper, and actually works better than costly sex drugs. That's all my, that's my headline and subhead. And it says, dear friend, they say us guys are always in one of two modes. One, having sex, or two, thinking about having sex. Me, I plead guilty on both counts. The mere thought of a beautiful woman always got me excited. By the time I hit my 40s, I was well past the amateur hour. I'd learned to savor a woman like a fine wine. For me, a sexless future would have been a fate worse than death. But then the worst happened. On November 14, 1992, I went in for a routine medical exam. What the doctor said hit me like a ton of bricks. John, there's a nodule on the left side of your prostate gland and the gland is hardened and abnormally enlarged. You have an extremely unhealthy prostate. That was a quote from Dr. James Kalkin in Santa Barbara, around, you know, wherever. I'm no rocket scientist, but I do know that my prostate is a key is a key player in the game of love. So for a virile, sexually active guy, those words were like kryptonite to Superman. I could not tell you what I really thought was worse, facing death or facing a life without sex. 
By the time I hit my 50s, after many sexually frustrating episodes, I began to lose interest in sex altogether. It hardly seemed worth the effort, let alone the embarrassment of disappointing my wife. And then in subhead, the chance encounter that saved my sex life. And then I started talking about me and the doctor. This was the letter, you know, that I said, you know, it says it's a true story. So I had, I had seen a testimonial that the guy wrote, this doctor wrote about it, and he got permission to use it. So I just thought, I started off with it. And that was my first my first control so why is the picture of white people on the cover is it white people yeah it's white people you know go figure go figure um but that's what we did and then, even though he told me that was now i do have a lot of black people throughout if you know, I don't know if you could oh you can uh, go on. are you is this blocking is a skype note blocking here no i could see you, you can see it you okay. held it up so yeah so it's like i mean well, throughout there we i have i make sure that i have i have all ethnic you know, uh, representations going through the package. But that was what we did. You know, I had, uh, well, I'm trying to think of what else. You got, see, I have, you know, I got black. I, so is this, for back then, this was big having in there. I don't know, I don't remember us doing, even doing a cover test with a black f uh, front, but I don't know. Don't ask me but it why worked. we did it. But they it probably worked. say it worked and they didn't want to change it. You got it. All right. So this is that's my book one. <laughs> Good thing I, you didn't ask about I'm gonna middle, make middle you, years. If we had six hours or ten hours, I would go through every single one of these books. <laughs> <laughs> one day I might put these all oh gosh, never mind, no. But I I learned I'm so glad I did that. That was something that I, I, I learned from day one was keep uh, even though yeah digital age, everything I have, you know, stuff but back then we didn't have as access like we did now. But I even still keep a hard copy. You know, have it everything digitally, but keep a hard copy of your stuff, mm -hmm. you know. So I just got these white binders. I thought, first I got this white binder. I said, man, it's going to take me years to fill this thing up. I am now on binder number. I just filled up binder number 27. Wow. And these are all at least one to two samples of packages that I've written since since my since I started copy mark, copy um my, my copywriting company, Cold Marketing Solutions. So pretty Brilliant. cool. I never thought that would be the case. It just kept growing. It's amazing. So what's the next major package that you wrote? After that one? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, OK. I got a great. This is a good story one. This was fun. We worked on a package. Clayton and I, Clayton um, was working for a company called Weiss Research. And Weiss was launching into the health field. They were, um, they are a, uh, a predominant, well, they are a um, an investment uh, safe, you know, investment investment type um, company. So that's what Martin Weiss is. He's brilliant at it. And Clayton was working with him and still works with him on the investment side. And Martin wanted to launch um, a, um, a a health division because the health was growing so well. So he bought the rights to use Dr. Uh, Balch, who had written the book uh, Prescriptions for Natural Healing. It's like the one of the, my favorite books. I love yeah. that book. Right. So Dr. Dr. That's Walsh. A fantastic his, book. Yeah, I have Dr. Walsh. I have, right Dr. Here. Walsh I have one of the books right here. I have, you yeah, have it? Let right me see. Here. Let me see it. Actually, I have all of his books, but it's the prescriptions for natural healing one. Can you see that? Bingo. Yeah. Well, that's herbal healing. Yeah, I have, I have the regular healing. one too, but the herbal yeah, one's the right other here. Yeah, the herbal one. Yes. So you're that's new. Yeah, going back in the day, right? Yeah. So this this one he wrote that one with his with his first wife Phyllis Balt. Fantastic. Two of them. Yeah. Okay, so we that Ma, Martin um, acquired the rights to use Dr. Balt as a you know for the newsletter. So the newsletter was going to be called um, Dr. Balch's Prescription for Natural Healing or something off that, close to the name of the book. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Martin thought you know when we were talking about what ideas that we would use, you know, and I said you know sex is always a good one to use to get people because nobody was really talking about it much in the mail but everybody's trying to figure out how does you know they're having problems you know yeah. the market's having problems with that but martin said said you know he said yes that's a great idea he wanted to do that and he said you know he wanted me and clayton to work on that package together because he wanted to do a, a sex package for men and women you know in the same time so he figured again having a female and having a male together to write the various pieces of the package that would really make it strong so we're like, okay, fine. To me, I'm like, whatever. It's a job, okay? It's a job, and I'm excited, right? And I just finished doing another sex package, so I'm on, I'm on a roll right there. By the way, I had to, um, <laughs> I, I hired all my kids at one point. I've hired all my kids to work for me in my job. Well, my son was about seven, seven or eight years old. 
um, at the time. And his job was every day he came from school, he would have to empty my trash and, you know, take it out. Because I'm, I'm filling up my trash can with paper all day long. So he had to come in. He got his allowance. And part of his job was to take my trash out every day. So my son would take my trash. It would usually take him five minutes. Come get the trash, empty it, bring it back. Well, then I noticed my son was taking longer to get the trash, you know. And so I'm going, what in the world? Maybe he's like eight or nine at this point. I'm not sure. But then they say, I know he's bringing his friends with him to take the trash out for me. And I started going, what? And I decided one day, let me look at my trash, you know. And it was all of the research I was doing on sex. <laughs> you know, I'm like trying to find different angles or whatever. So he's taking this stuff out. And he's reading <laughs> So I had to buy a shredder. Is my That's point. Okay, funny. moving on. So all right. So I had to. Um, I'm working on this package with Clayton, and we're gonna call. Oh, I have it in here too. That was still my first year. So let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, oh, I got it. I got it. Oops. This one. Hmm, man, this is going back in the day. Thank you. I haven't looked at stuff in a long time. Let's dust all, right, all so of them this, off. Let's dust all of them off today. I'm blowing the dust off. Absolutely. <laughs> so it we call. This was it. Forbidden Secrets of Sex and Healing. How Passion and Pleasure Can Help Heal Your Body. Okay? And this was to sell a newsletter with Dr. Balch called, you know, um, um, what was the newsletter called? I can't remember the newsletter. Prescriptions for, yeah, Prescriptions for Healthy Living is what it is called. And so they got all these free reports, you know, Mysteries of Sex and Healing was, it was, was what this is all about. So we were going to use this package to talk about as here he is, Dr. Ball, people don't know he was, um, he is a, well, he was a, um, I'm not sure if he's still practicing anymore, but he was a urologist. Mm. So what great credentials have a urologist talk about your sex life? You know, Perfect. he knows what's yeah. going on over there. So anyway, um, Clayton and I work on this package and we're, you know, trying to just really make it work. And, you know, uh, so then we, we, we do the package, we turn it in. Martin loves the package. He thought it was great. We mailed the package. It did great in the mail. Very happy with it. So we're having like a meeting and we all get together because I'm in Maryland. Clayton's what well, was in, I don't know if it was Florida or North Carolina, wherever he was at the time. He bounced around a lot. And then Martin is in Florida. So we, we all converge for a meeting for the team. Uh, and Martin is going on about, wow, what a brilliant idea he had to bring me and Clayton together to write this package because when he reads parts of the package, he could just see, you know, the, the, the influence, um, that, you know, I, that, uh, you know, we had here because this one section for women only, you know, and he says, you know, he read this section, he could just see the feminine side coming through and, and realize like how like oh, Carlene, I could just see how you just brought that into the package and just made it really real for women. And I went, um, that was Clayton. You know, that was his sidebar. <laughs> and he goes, okay, fine. And then he says, you know, all right, well then um, when I'm looking here, he's going here and he's, he's going through, I think which one was it? Um, oh, when he got into this section about, you know how to ener energize your sex life with this stamp, this this the stamina booster. Hold it up booster. a little bit. Hold, Hold it up a little bit. Huh? Hold it up a little. Yeah. Hold oh, it up a you little. Know, bit. How yeah. How to energize? Yeah. How to energize? He says, "I'm reading this section, and I'm going, what? This is really good." He goes, "I could, that could just, you know, I'm using terminology throughout the package with thrusting and this and that." And he goes, "I really saw Clayton just, you know, the male influence coming through in this package," and I went. <laughs> That was me, you know, so he was all wrong. <laughs> Clayton had the feminine side. I had the masculine side. It didn't matter. We put it all together and we did it. So the package mailed. It mailed for a good while. I'm not sure how long. It was at least about a year and a half, two years, you know, with it. But it was like, once again saying, you know what, it's not you're not anybody but the vehicle to get the message across. So it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're male or female, right to your market. Mm -hmm. So this was my, this followed up as being my second control. Well now, before when I got my, when I got that control, my first control, before then I was calling up, um, I was calling up people and saying, hey, I'd like to write for you, whatever, whatever. They'll say, oh sure, Carlene, send me your samples. I had no samples of what I was trying to do, you know, so I was kind of stuck there, you know. And so once I got my first control, my whole pitch changed. I called the same people back up and I said, hey, I know you're busy, but I've, I've got a hot new control. Let me just send you my latest, newest, 
hottest control for you to take a look at because you don't have time to be looking at everything. I'm going to send you my latest one, okay? Oh, sure, no problem. Well, my latest, my newest, whatever was my also my only. Right. Didn't matter. I used that control to get me into the doors for the next client, and yeah. then I used the next controls from there, and it just started building up from there. So I did have a... I did have a, a, a you know an entourage of, of packages I could uh, I could share, but it was always how you phrase it. I'm not gonna I never You're lie. Marketing and positioning, yes, exactly. You never lie. It's how you market and position yourself. It's like here's my latest control. Here's my most recent control. Here's my hottest control. Whatever it is, I know you're busy. You don't have time for that. You know, and you had to mail that stuff off back in the day. It wasn't just emailing it off like we do now. So that was um, that was a cool one. So that was my second. I one. love that, that story. Was, uh, Colleen, how do you, when you're early on, how do you negotiate rates? Your rates, and I know some people, you know, maybe have a flat rate or um, a royalty. How does how does that get negotiated early on? Um, well, I knew, I knew from day one that I was going to be a royalty copywriter, mm -hmm. and that was because I only worked with copy. I mean, well, that's not true. I worked the majority of the copywriters that I worked with at Phillips were royalty based copywriters. There were a few who were flat fee. And I never understood why they were flat fee. You know, I don't think they understood. I think they thought it was safer just to get the money mm -hmm. as opposed to hoping somebody pays you later on type thing. Um, so there was, you know, so I knew just from being on the inside of how marketing worked that, no, if I'm writing a package and the client is mailing my package, I want a piece of that action every time they mail mm -hmm. my package. So I knew that's what I wanted to be. So it was, a, it was non, it was a non issue. Now, how do I get that rate? Well, I started off, I mean, the first package, you know, it was really kind of negotiating, finding out, I tried to find out what the client's budget is. You know, I knew what the what rates were going for at the time for really good writers. So I came right under them because I knew I wasn't going to be able to, you know, be there. But I didn't go that far away. Let's say let's say if it was ten thousand dollars back, you know, back in 1999 or so. Um, let's say let's say let's say ten or, you know, or, or, or Clayton maybe at the time, you know, could have made could have made would made more than that. But for average writers, maybe it was coming in at about ten thousand dollars if you had samples. You know, I'd come in about six thousand, you know, to say I can write this package. Because you don't want to come in so low that people think like, well she wrong? might not be that good after yeah. all. You know, but at the same time, I want them to feel like they're getting a better deal with me, you know, because I am still they know I'm new. I don't have a lot of samples. But it's one of those kind of work it, you gotta you gotta finesse it. So if you can try to get the client to say, you say to them, well, what's your budget? What's your marketing budget? You know, so I would always, whatever my price was, I would always tie in a royalty with it. First, it was a one cent royalty. You know, I'm like, okay, I'll charge six thousand dollars to write this plus a one cent royalty. You know, and then my then you know one set two. All you need is one or two controls, and you can start. Your race can go up just like this because I'm right now. I charge twenty five thousand dollars for a package and a four cent royalty. You know, so that's not that much of a time difference to be able to go. You know, and that that big jump. So I started once I got one or two controls. I went from six to ten thousand. I started being right where everybody else was, and from ten. I'm sorry, I went from six to twelve twelve thousand five hundred. You know, and then from there, I stayed there for a while, and then I went to fifteen thousand, and then I went to twenty thousand, and then at that point, I was getting enough business. I'm like, oh, it's twenty five thousand. Whoever can pay twenty five thousand will get me to do this for them. You right. know, and so that's how, and I've kind of that that seems to be where where the market is letting me stay, and I'm okay with that. Sure, I mean, I only one, I only know of of maybe one or two copywriters who have who've charged. Like I know Gary Bensavenga has charged fifty thousand dollars for a package. You know, and I know that when I was at when I was at Phillips, so that would have still been like in the in the early '90s, in the late '80s, early early '90s. There was a, um, a copywriter named Jim Punkry, and he charged a hundred thousand dollars to write a package. However, he didn't get paid that hundred thousand dollars until that package was a control. So in essence, he wrote the package. The stipulation, yeah. Yeah, the, he wrote the package for nothing up front, and then when they tested the package, if he beat the packet, the control. Then he would get a hundred thousand dollars, and then his royalty would kick in. Mm -hmm. That's sweet, you know. And I don't think it, he got that. He got an agreement for that too often, but I know that was one of his price structures. On you know, most writers now, I think you know, on the top end, we're like about twenty five thousand. Um, you know, is 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 good. It's good for me. I'm happy with it. That's phenomenal. So, is a four percent? Does that mean on each piece that's mailed? Is that what that it's is? Four Four cents. Four cents. That's what I mean. Four cents. Four yeah. Cents. So for every one piece 
you mail, I get four cents. So you mail a million pieces, I get forty thousand dollars. You know. So that's how it, you know. So that's is, and then um, I do it where you can now I structure my deal where you know you mail the first hundred thousand pieces for um, you know without any royalty. It gives you a chance to test the package out to see is this working, is yeah. this not working, you know, whatever. And when this when you've used up the hundred thousand pieces to yeah. test however you want to test at a hundred thousand and one, my royalty kicks in. Yeah. Carleen, I could literally talk to you for days and just have you go through every <laughs> single one of these binders and dust all of them off and talk about all of them. I'm not going to make so you. I so easy all the dust. <laughs> I'm not going to make you do that, but I would if you let me. But just um, what's been one of the most successful campaigns? And walk me through. Walk me through it. Um, you know. I have a hard time with saying successful campaigns because mm -hmm. I don't always get the the money, the numbers that go in with it. I mean, I'll know, for example, I can tell by my royalty checks that things are working really well. Right. Um, and so I could like like I, like Clayton knew his package mailed ninety million pieces. I don't know how many my, my packages mail all the time because I don't I don't keep up with it. Like I guess I, I, guess I should, um, but I could tell with the checks. You know, I'm like if you're mm -hmm. sending me a check for forty thousand dollars. And you're mailing, you know, I'm getting checked on a monthly basis. Then I know this package is doing pretty well, you know. So I'm not complaining. Okay, but I will tell. But I can talk about my most successful packages that have been the the, the most fun for me. You know, I want to hear both. that I can talk about. I'm looking. I can, oh, I have samples. I, I, I yeah, get the samples out. But I'm going to talk for a second as you look. But I'm looking at your site. Anyone should go to CarleenCole.com, and you have Kickbuck Controls tab. And you can look on the right-hand side of, I'm just looking at uh, Biscayne Lab, Schweiz Health, Mushroom Miracle, Panic Attack. Like, just some of the covers of these are phenomenal. True oh. Health, you have like 10 of them listed there. Um, yeah. Hampshire Lab. So I would encourage anyone to go on Health Resources. You have another 10 or 15 of well, these. Yeah. Um, just looking through these is is pretty mind blowing. Uh, some well, of the, let, let me tell you this: on yeah. the my my one of my the one year I'm trying to figure out what year it was. I can tell from look at the package. One year I literally crowned myself the queen of poop. Okay. What is that? Because I wrote so many packages on constipation, digestive problems, anything dealing with bowel health. You know, that year we put a pool in our backyard. And I, tell, I always told my kids, and I'm like, you're swimming in poop, guys. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what did it. That package totally, what was totally it? was, you know, the, the reason why, you know, they were out there, you know, having a great time. And if for some reason, I don't know, it was actually a period of maybe almost three years where I was writing one package after another and they were all dealing with poop in some way or another. And and they were working like crazy. So on my website, I'll, I have that sample. But one of my, that, this is one, this was one of the breakthrough ones. Under health resources, I called it up right now. Let me see. Under health resources, yeah, there's a, a photo of a guy, the ball guy, sitting on a toilet. I, I and he's saw, like this. It. And see, what does the headline say? You Can't see go. Can't go, you know? And so we did that. Now, let me tell you a story behind that package. At the time, Health Resources was one of my best clients. I worked with them for seven years straight. I was knocking out packages. I was writing two packages a month for them. 24 packages I wrote in one year. Wow. This is the, the side, 24 page, Magalaws, whatever. We got this real great system going where it was, I mean, the, the owner of the company at the time was, was Lane Lowry, another brilliant person that I worked with in my career. And it was, he gave me full creative freedom. You know, it's like, just give me controls. You know, I would write the package. He would take it through legal, kind of do as minimal changes changes as possible to get it through so it wouldn't be a problem and then we turn around we mail that sucker and go with the next one well that package the can't go package was um for health resources advanced colon advanced colon two i think was the name of the product you know it's, it's a it's a natural you know um um you know it, it had fiber it's not to make, it makes you poop that's what it like does you know? husk and so, type of metamucil anyway, stuff yeah. um yeah so so he, so we did this package, and we would go. I found this great story about this woman who was having all kinds of problems with her, her bowels and everything else, and she was taking the pink 
stuff to help her because she was so constipated. She couldn't go. She was taking it. She was getting diarrhea, but she was take, taking it to stop the diarrhea. And then finally one day, you know, she literally died from it's asphyxiating on her on her stool is what it came That's up to. Horrible. True story. Horrible. I know, right? Isn't that great? I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible for life, but it's awesome for, for copywriting and to tell a story. Like this woman died, you know, because she pretty much ended up choking on her poop, I... you know, and that was the story that that pack is all about. This is it was a true story. So I'm writing about this stuff, and I'm like, oh, this is so gross. I love it. This is gross. Yuck. I love it. I love it. Love it. You know. So I'm writing this package from there, and it's doing. You know, get it done. We we tested for health and health resources. And it kicked butt. I mean, that thing was mailing like crazy. Was doing wonderful. So Lane had a sister company called True Health. That he a lot of the products mimicked one another. If he had a success in health resources, he's like, hey, I'm going to get a competitor for this product. So let me be my own competitor. So then he would turn around and True Health. He had a doctor, a different voice, and we would change the formulas a little bit around, but for the most part, a similar formula. And then he would then compete against himself. You know, he gets the money either way. Brilliant. So he said, Carlene, this this package is doing so well. I don't want somebody coming out here with it. And we don't have time to do a full blown package. What can you do for me here? I'm like, all right, well, let's do this. Let's just change the front. Let's just change the cover. You know, he says, I got a new product. It's similar. I've added a couple of different ingredients. I'm like, great. We'll change the ingredient breakdown, but we're going to keep the copy essentially the same. The same story with the woman choking on her poop is in this package as well as if you scroll down on my website. Let me go down right here. You scroll down to True Health. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Maybe you scroll up. Which way is it? Yeah, you scroll up to True Health. You're going to see another picture of an older guy with the white t shirt, you know, the white feeder t shirt. You see that one? I see one. He's sitting on the toilet. Yeah. And what is he saying? What's the headline for that one? Wanna go? Wanna go? So we got can't go to wanna go. This one just worked as well as the other one. So, <laughs> it just, this, this job just cracks me up. You know, what can I say? It just no strain, cracks. no pain, no kidding. No kidding, no strain, no pain, no kidding. And that picture is just great. It's great. So we thought, okay, and so when you read the package, if you read that package along with the, the one for health resources, the copy for the most part is identical until I get to the individual ingredients and then I change it up to make sure the ingredients represent the right products. Right. And then I change the reports, pretty much name changing it all. Mm. We, I got that thing, that package done in a week. You know, because we want to hurry up and get in lane said, well, let's just get it out in the mail for now. That gives us some time. I'll, I'll hire another writer to write a package for me, you know, and then, the, you know, but in the meantime, let's get this thing on the market. Well, he never needed to get another writer to write the package because it was doing so well that he just kept mailing it over and over. So they was like, can't go, want to go, can't go, want to go. You know, one company, the other company, and people are getting them both in the mail. It didn't matter. It just, it worked. It worked for a couple of years. You know, so I love that, that was a story. That, so that was like, it was a successful story. Was it my most successful? I don't know. It was one of my most successful ones, but it was sure was a heck of a lot of fun because what that meant for me, and I even told him in that package, I didn't even have the heart to take a, the, the deposit from him, you know, because I'm going, it's really, essentially I'm writing the same package. So our deal was, as soon as you start mailing this thing, I get the royalties on it. You know, he said, deal. You know, at, at, at that time, this was years ago, my, my deal was, you pay twenty five thousand. It was it was more of an advance, you know. So you got to mail enough pieces to re, you know recoup your twenty five thousand before my royalties would kick in. Got it. Well, that changed. You know, that was back in the day. Now I don't do that. I just you have a hundred thousand pieces and that's it. So back so back then I'm like, okay, listen, let's cut this whole. I won't take the twenty five thousand deposit. And we're gonna go straight to royalties on it. And okay. he was fine. He goes, absolutely, this is great. We mailed that thing. So I'm getting poop checks coming back. You know, right and left for. <laughs> So I officially became the queen of poop, you know, I like uh, that. With, that, with those packages back to back. And I had other ones that were on digestion or other probiotic packages. And I mean, I can I, that. should I name this interview the queen of poop or what? what should I... <laughs> if you like, <laughs> it is what it is. You know, I, you know, I'm just saying, I'm not ashamed of it. I, I say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm number one when it comes to number two. <laughs> I like that.
What is so? Tell me about Oprah, Carlene. Oh, okay. Well, I always tell people I, I went. I just attended the AWAI seminar last week, yeah. and it was great. I mean, these people every year they they just get better and better. It's the American Writers and Artists Institute, mm -hmm. and then once a year in October, usually they have this huge copywriting seminar for people who want to be copywriters, and they bring in experienced copywriters. I mean, these are people you would you would never get to see. If you got to see them, then you would be paying four to ten thousand dollars to yeah. see them, and yet they were all brought together. So Clayton Makepeace was there, Richard Armstrong, um, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Uh, we had there was Brian Brian um, Kurtz from Boardroom was mm -hmm. the president of, of Boardroom was there. Michelle Wolk was the creative director of Boardroom. She was there. I mean, these are people mm -hmm. you would never ever ever yeah. get to see. Um, uh, unless Rocky you watch my interviews, there. unless you watch my uh, interview, unless you watch my interviews, Caroline. Unless well, I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I said unless someone watches my interviews, then unless you, they you, watch your stuff. Yeah, right, exactly. True. But I'm yeah. just saying to get these people and you're spending a few days with them, eating with them, and you know, just you're touching them, you're talking with them, the whole thing, right? So it was. Um, I forgot I mentioned. I said um, Healthy Directions. Uh, Ashley Delaney was the vice president of Healthy Directions. She's there. Uh, I mean, just a lot of people that you just would not yeah. get all into one at one time. And um, you in front of you. you so did. anyway, um, oh, I just had a brain fart. What was I talking about? Uh, and, and you, of course. You were oh, talking about the AW. Yeah, I did speak there. Oprah. Speak. Well, oh, Oprah. Okay, so I, t I say this. I, one of the things I spoke was how to write faster copy. One thing I told them was you got to niche yourself. You have to know what you want to do. You got to focus on your niche. And when you, when you do that and you do that well, it's easy to write faster copy because you don't have to relearn you know, anything that you're doing because you kind of know the base of the, you know who you're writing to, you have all that already in your head. It's just a matter now of getting to know who your, um, you know, your, your product is and your, you know, that way. So it's easier to write that way. So I tell them all that. And I said, it's when there is one exception. And then I went to a slide, I click, I'm like, it's when Oprah calls, you know? And at that point you just, <laughs> you drop it. And you say, I'm writing for Oprah, you know. So what happened was I got a call. I mean, literally, I got a call from Ox, Ox, Oxmore House was the, um, the, the company that was um, uh, promoting Oprah as a direct mail piece, you know, you know, to market the old magazine, a direct mail. And they called me and they said, you know, we've heard great things about you. We saw your website. We like what you've done, you know. And I had worked for them in the past before, so they knew that, you know, I was easy to work with. And they said, we got this opportunity right for Oprah. And we just thought there would be nobody else that we want but you to do this. And you're interested, you know. And I'm like, wow, thanks. Yes, I am, you know. And then I, and I said, I got the designer already that I want. I knew I wanted Lori Haller, yeah. period, the end. You know, it's like, that's, that's, we're a team. We're going to come in here and do this, right? And we did. We got to, it was, it was a very difficult job. I mean, working for Oprah is no you know, walk in the park, you know, because they have such restrictions. I felt sorry for Lori because, I mean, they gave her a palette of colors she's allowed to use, the Oprah, um, uh, Oprah okay colors and the no, no colors. I mean, it was all these things she had to do. And I had more uh, freedom with the uh, writing it, although they did kind of rein me in a lot afterwards. But still, it was just to be able to say you work for Oprah. I did not get to meet Oprah. Um, I'm, uh, but I did get to at least get access to all of her stuff. And I know she had to approve the copy before it went. So that was my, my close, my close sighting of mm -hmm. Oprah. I did have a, on a personal side though, I, um, I have a friend I went to college with. Her name is Sherry uh, Burgess Brooks. Sherry, she's really the only person I went to USC, uh, uh, for two, it was there for two years, two and a half years. And, um, and Sherry has been a friend of mine since my, my freshman year in college. We've known each other forever. And um, so Sherry, um, I, went, I said, I was, I was doing this, this one year I decided, you know, I got to let the people that I love really, really know that I love them. You know, I have to, I want to just, I just have to, if I die tomorrow, they would really know that, that they were instrumental in my life for whatever reason. Well, that, that year I was doing, I had picked certain people that I was going to go and Sherry was one of them. So I called her, she's in California and I said, Hey, let me know when's a good time. I just want to come out and see you and just, you know, spend a weekend with you if you're available or a day, whatever you can give me, but I want to spend some time with you. And, and cause I love you and I want you to know this, you know, and I said, let me know what's good for you. So what I'll do is I have a client out there in California. I'll tie it in and I'll go see my client, you know, but then I'll go on a Friday or a Thursday and then on, you know, we'll get together. She said, Oh, I would love it. That would be great. Whatever. So we set the time of the day. I set the time with the client. 
to go meet with, with her out there. It's great. We're all good to go. And so literally three days before my trip, um, I called to confirm with my client that I was coming at so-and-so time. I get a message that she no longer works for the company anymore. She's gone. Hmm. And I'm like, I don't know what happened to this day. I still don't know what happened. But they said, um, she's no longer here. You know, and I'm like, well, crap, I got this trip scheduled. You know, I was going to go. So I called Sherry. I said, hey, listen, you know, my client, I don't know what happened, but she's gone. And uh, so Sherry says, well, hey, just come anyway. And you can come with me, you know, just come with me. Um, I, we'll take care of it, you know. So I show up and Sherry, and I, you know, she picks me up at the airport. We go. She goes, I thought maybe you want to come to go to work with me. And I said, oh, okay, sure, no problem. It's cool. Well, Sherry works for Sydney Poitier. You know, she's his personal assistant. And Sherry drives me to Sydney Poitier's house. And I get to spend the whole day in Sherry's office in Mr. Poitier's house. I met his wife. I met his daughter. And while Sherry's on the phone, I hear her talking to Tyler Perry, to Oprah. And I'm like, oh, my God, tell her I said hi. <laughs> but she couldn't do that because she's working <laughs> So I got closer to Oprah to tell this whole long story. I got closer to Oprah when I was at my friend Sherry's job when working for Sydney Poitier. I got to hear Oprah's voice as you know, uh, that I did working on the old magazine. But hey, it's a cute story anyway. I, I love Sherry. that story. You tell great cool. stories. <laughs> Carlene, I know we only have a little bit more time left, even though I wish we didn't. Um, what's a campaign that didn't work and why? Oh my gosh. Oh, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm telling you all these great success stories. Yeah. Trust me, I had a lot of bombs, you know, and the bombs are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, because when I write a package, I, I try to, I try to write the package and then I try to have different cover tests that address different aspects. So I always try to have what I call my bread and butter. Mama got to pay the rent, you know, uh, cover. So that, you know, it's usually a very, like a benefit oriented headline, something that's just bam, it may not be sexy, but it's, it's getting to the USP of the product, you know, something like that will be my, 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 my bread and butter package. And from there, depending on how many cover tests I'm allowed to have, I will run the spectrum and I want to do what I call my home run. You know, it's going to be either a strike. I mean, it's going to be a strike to where I literally fall down because I'm trying to hit it so hard and I miss. Or it's going to take that sucker out of the ballpark, you know. So I try to go for it. And every package I write, I try to have at least one cover where I'm just trying to go for it, you know. And I know the, the, the probability of, of losing is high, but the probability of coming up with something brilliant is also high, you know. So I just take a chance in there. Mm -hmm. And so based on that that type, I get a lot of stuff that sucks, you know, a lot of stuff that, that, that doesn't work. Um, and so what's something you know, that uh, didn't that you obviously think would have done outstanding? You know, I, oh, OK, Here, a recent I did. A, I did a promotion I wrote and I was I believed in the product. I thought it was very good. I thought I had a really good message, you know, for the, the market. I was very excited. You know, I was good about it. Usually I, a barometer for me of if my, if my package is working well is Am I, am I getting excited when I write about it? Do I want to take this product? And I try to take all the products that I use, except the male potency stuff. Um, but I, you know, I try to do that, and I try to, you know, really just sell myself on the product. And because I feel when I do those things, I got a real good chance I've connected with who I'm writing to. And I was writing for a product that I really thought was a good product. I thought I had a good message in there, and the results came back. I mean, they were abysmal they were so bad that you, i had to say are you sure you guys even mailed my package <laughs> i kind of wish they had gotten zero orders because then i would have said no you didn't mail my package but they got orders so it did mail you know and it was so bad you know and at that point you know the whole my the, the whole you know oh man i suck i suck i suck you know that negative vibe keeps playing in there and you feel depressed and you're just like shoot you know where did i go off how did i miss this and you start second guessing yourself and say maybe you're not that good after all and all this stuff this was this was not that long ago we're talking recently here you know i've been doing this now for 16 years on my own and we're not talking about 16 years ago this is talking about mm -hmm. recently and it just was like i'm like i cannot believe this thing did so bad 
you know, in the mail. What did I do wrong? So when that happens, at first, again, the ego is just squashed. You just take the day off. Just take the day off because you're useless anyway because you're just feeling negative and you just kind of go back and you look at stuff that you i have a feel good file that i keep of stuff that i'm like oh this was great this was great go back and build myself up so then i call the client up and i said you know what i don't know what the heck happened i don't know why this bomb so bad but i am willing to work on this package i'm willing to give you another package you know i'm not going to charge you for it i don't understand but i'm i don't like this this is this is this makes me mad you know so I, i wrote the package again you know he hasn't mailed it um, you know, uh, I don't know. To my knowledge, I don't think he's mailed it yet to, to, to what, see how it's what done. What do you think was wrong with it? Why, why do you I think don't it didn't know. Work? Look, if I knew, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> 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 it's kind of like, you know, duh, if I knew that. But like I said, you got to have the right message to the right yeah. market at the right time. You know, one of those out of kilter can jack you up and you yeah. don't know what it is for example to this day well, what's a guess well i thought maybe my copy ran too long and so i did this next next version i did i did short i did short mix mm-hmm. you know i think one mistake that i made i don't like to do this i don't like to sell kits you know like one two three products that make up a kit i don't like to sell kits i really don't have a lot of success uh high success rate selling those i like to sell single products i can zoom in and focus in whereas this one was a kit and i thought you know what that's not my strength anyway i knew i had knew that going into it i just thought it was such a good product that i could make it work so maybe it may have been that i'm trying to sell these three products and trying to make them together and I take them too long to write the copy. So I, I did, I went back and did a kind of postpartum, postmortem, not postmortem, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a postmortem on him. Right. And um, then said, maybe that's what it is. And so I went back and I just kind of tightened everything up mm. and to see what it is. So I, I don't know. I had to go look at it and go, where the heck did I go wrong here? You know, what is it? Yeah. And if he mails this one again and it's still not working, then I'm going to start the question, of, does he really have a market, you know, for this? Because it was a new launch. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. It, it, it yeah. drives me batty to no means. But um, it happens. It happens all the time. So you, and, it will, and, if, and it needs to actually, it, it happens. And when it happens, it's humbling. So it lets you know you still got a lot of growing to do. I mean, I feel like I'm still learning every package I write. I'm still learning more and more about it. Fortunately, it doesn't happen as often as it used to, which is good. But it becomes definitely a humbling experience to say, if you don't have your act together, this will happen again. And it makes you tighten up on your on your writing and on your on your goals. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I wish I wish I had the answer, but I don't. Yeah. So Carlene, I appreciate your time. I have one last question before I ask it. If you need to, I can push it to 515. That's the latest. <laughs> I told you five, but I can push it to if you need to. I'll, I'll keep it because I will just keep going and going with you. Yeah, so, I, I think that'd be great. But yeah. like, um, my last question before I ask it, tell people where they can find you. What are you working on lately? Where, where, oh, the, okay. where should they check you out online? Um, well, my website is carlinecole.com, uh, C-A-R-L-I-N-E and cole.com. So, that's where you know. Actually, let me tell. Let me tell you what I could use from if you have anybody. I have my website up and going. I have not updated this website in so long because I had somebody help me with it, and, and and they're not doing it anymore. So I'm actually looking for somebody who knows direct mail, but who also knows website design mm-hmm. who can help me out. So if I anybody do. you know can do that. I do. Combination of some copywriting and some website. I, let me tell me. I actually, get in touch with me. I actually do. So I will put okay. you in touch. Yes. All right, great. So that's one thing because, like I said, I have more samples than this, but I just. You know, it, it just drained me to think about technology. As you know, trying to get this this interview going, the troubles we had in the morning, just you know, get this going. Technology. I'm like, what button? What do I do, Jeremy? Where? I Where mean, is this? Ah. It's not even yeah. your fault. It's just sometimes the technology itself just doesn't cooperate. Well, it, yeah. you know, I think it's always my fault because I don't understand technology at all. So <laughs> it's fine. Anyway, to answer your question. So my, my website, I have it, but I used to do a, a newsletter, a e-zine every month to send out. I, I really haven't been up doing it lately because I've just really been swamped. And it's not swamped only from work. It's swamped in, in the sense that I'm really, right now, my kids are all grown. Yeah. You know, I have these, like I said, two and a half grandchildren. One, and my oh, third one is yeah. about to come 
uh, in January. So I'm really, and my husband and I are traveling, traveling a lot. So my time is full in a great way. Yeah, so it's not like I'm yeah. just being this workaholic. It's just quality of life and everything else involved with it. Yeah. So it's been very um, busy. But in the meantime, I, I did, uh, I, I just finished a couple of new, pro I like doing launches. I, I always tell my clients, you know, I have four children because I like to give birth. If I could just keep giving birth and I have to raise these children, I would do it. I really? would totally do it. Sounds like yeah, the worst know, thing ever. But I feel ever. like wow. if I give birth to them, I'm responsible. <laughs> so um, anyway, oh, that's saying. So um, so instead of giving birth to children, I really have focused on giving birth to products a lot. So mm -hmm. I've been do I do a lot of launches in my um, in my business. So I did a really cool launch that is going to happen in January. We all we're finished with it, so I'm excited. It's a very different approach for an old an old client that I had. So I don't I can't talk about it yet because it hasn't launched. I can't talk about any of them because they haven't launched. But right. it's a it's a different twist to the for the market that's coming out in January. Um, so that one I was excited about. That was fun. I wrote that package in just a matter of a couple of weeks because it was just exciting to to do this. Mm -hmm. And then I just fit, turned in some copy for another launch. That's another one that's exciting coming out probably February. Can't talk about that one either. Now I'm working on. I'm supposed to be. I started working on a. Uh, uh, this is not a launch, so I can talk about this one. Um, I'm writing to try to beat a, a, a control for um, a product for a natural um, mood uh, lifter. It's sort of the you know if people who are experiencing um, depression, you know, even bipolar. I mean, of course, I can't mention that in a promotion, but it's somebody looking for a natural alternative, you know, to the blues, in essence. So. That that one I start this week uh, to work on, so I'm excited about that one. So my last question, Carleen, and, and let me no, tell you. No, the other one was your last question. Well, no, <laughs> no, th that doesn't count because I was asking you oh. to promote yourself. Oh, I was promoting myself. Oh shoot, I didn't do a good yeah. job on that one, did I? <laughs> I think the the whole interview does that actually, but <laughs> but um, the questions I'm not going to ask for my last question that I still have. And this is not, this don't answer these, but. I wanted to hear about the mushroom miracle, so I'm just gonna have to look at it. I wanted to hear the best advice that Clayton gave you. I wanted to hear how you did it with four kids. I wanted to hear about a lot of other things. But what I will ask is, you know, like we talked a lot about successes, and I wanted to hear two things. One, your lowest point and your most proud moment. Okay. Um, my lowest point. This is within my career. Yeah. Um, my lowest points in my career are always, and it's not just it's, it's plural. It really is when I, when I have a when I have a, a loss uh, as far as I lose. Why well, I, I just didn't do a great job on a package. Um, it really, it really sucks me dry, you know, for that time period, because I feel like when I'm working on a project, I give it my all. I tell people all the time, I become an expert. If I'm writing about mushrooms, I become an expert in mushrooms. You know, I devour all kinds of information I possibly can get my hands on, on mushroom and I understand it and I go with it and then I write the package, you know, with it. And after I write the package, you know, it just is gone. I now become an expert in the next project. You know, I'm always an expert, but it doesn't stay in my brain. I lose it because I can't remember what mushrooms are about when I finish three months later, you know. But I, so I really get into it and I really believe and I really think I've got something good that the market wants. And I, so I've got all that. And then if it were to come back where it didn't work or it just really bombed or whatever, that really, that, that's a, that's a punch in my gut that, it, it really does a, a, a job on me to where I had to I have a little process that I have to take myself through so I don't get depressed so much mm -hmm. I can't do something else you mm -hmm. know and and it is and that with that process is sort of okay you have to assess the situation you get the facts when a client says it didn't work what does that really mean you know if it means it, it was 20 percent less than the control well it just means my package didn't become the control. It doesn't mean my package didn't work because that client still was able to grab names from that package and they were still able to now market those names on the back end and also sell those names on the list rental side to make money. So even though if I come close to a control, 
and I don't beat the control. Yeah, I don't have the control, but it doesn't mean that my package didn't work for the client. It doesn't mean the client lost money. Right. And therefore, it doesn't mean the client won't call me back again to say, hey, try this. And I want you to try another package. So that keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Find out what doesn't work means, you know. And now if it just sucked, I mean, like stunk up the whole place or whatever, then I have to stop and say, all right, was this my idea? Or was this like a, an idea by committee? And I, when those happen, it's so hard because I will take ownership of my idea to the end if it is my idea. But if, if I have an idea to do something and in the process, they're changing it, they're changing the direction and people are adding on to it that my thoroughbred becomes a zebra, you know, down the ride where I'm like, well, this really wasn't my idea. That's not what I wanted to mail. My idea ended up getting cut somewhere on the floor or whatever. So that package didn't work. So I don't, I don't, it doesn't get me as much. You know, I'm going, yeah, well, my idea was left back here. This is what we end up mailing because it was by committee. And I hate that, but it happens. So, okay, it sucks. All right, great. I'm not taking ownership for it. The hardest thing is when I fight for an idea and they let me go ahead and do it. And then it sucks. And I'm like, shoot, that's me all the way. <laughs> well, that's when I take the day off. That's when I go get a massage. That's when I just got to, you know, I'll call Clayton and cry going, I suck, I suck, I suck, you know, or just whatever I need to do to go woo, hoo, hoo, woo, woo, whatever, whatever. And then I stop and I say, get real, look at the stuff. Have you had controls before? Have you, you know, have you had successes? Do you have clients? What is, you know, I just kind of walk myself through the whole thing. It's like, yeah, if it didn't suck then you wouldn't appreciate the great stuff that you have. This is humbling. Go figure out what did it. Always offer, if I have a package that doesn't work, I always offer the client a rewrite of the package. You know, if I really feel that my my copy wasn't used, you know, like it should have been, I'll say, let me write the package for you. I can let me rewrite it and see whatever needs to be done. And I'm willing to do that for the client and I don't charge them anything for it. And they can retest it if they want to. So I try to make up for it in whatever way possible. If the client says no and whatever, okay, you got to move on. Mm -hmm. You just got to move on because mm -hmm. like I said, was it was my member of Hank Aaron, you know, home run King, you know, whatever the number he had, he's a home run King, but he's also a strikeout King. Nobody talks about that. Right. You know, and same thing with copywriting. Uh, you can have you can have a bunch of bombs. Just get a success, and you'll talk about the success. And people will talk about that. They'll say they don't talk about the losses because that's the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. That's how we work. That's how it rolls. And so that's what we do. So it's cool. And the proudest? Oh my gosh, my proudest moment, without a doubt, was you know I mentioned to you that we came from Haiti. And my mom, my mom was a single mom. She had my sister. She was very young. She had me even this is, you know, four years later, still young um, and uh, was raising us. And, and she married my stepfather and I have a brother. With them. So the three of us, um, you know, lived together. And my parents, my mom, my stepfather really, really struggled to take care of us. And my mom, especially, she is just my hero in so many ways because my mom has never made more than probably $13,000 in her a year in her career, you know, cause she came here, she worked as a, as a, um, a maid, a housekeeper, whatever she needed to do to, to, to make money while she was trying to learn the language. And she got to the point where we never thought we were poor. We weren't poor. We were just lower middle class, but all my friends were lower middle class. So, you know, that's how we rolled, you know? So my proudest moment would be when my mom, this would have been about, um, uh, 10, almost 11 years ago, when my mom was working as a cafeteria at school, and I, uh, I got her to move down here. I got her to move to Georgia. She's ready to retire, and we took her down and said, "Okay, let's go. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna go down here." And uh, so I took her. And she said, "Why are we? Why are we here? Looking, you know, it was a model home place or whatever." I said, "We're gonna pick out your house." Wow. And so my husband and I were able to buy my mom a brand new house. Whatever she wanted in the house, that's what she wanted. She got it. And I mean, you know, it's a three bedroom ranch. It's not, she didn't buy a mansion, you know, but for her, that's her mansion. Yeah. Um, and because bank, she never had a new house in her life. Everything, everything she wanted, the hardwood floors, the, this and that, whatever, she got it. And then we went shopping for the furniture, all new furniture, and we furnished the whole house. 
that moment, it was like, oh my gosh, this would never, ever, ever have been able to, to happen if it wasn't for copywriting, yeah. you know, for copywriting, giving me the, the opportunity to make enough money to do things like that. And thought, shortly after that happened, drove to my mom's job one day and she asked me, hey, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I need a ride. And she goes, you need a ride? Where's your car? And I said, I don't have a car. You do. And I gave her the keys to a Mercedes. Wow. And that was my mom. So that that combined, again, would not, I mean, I feel very blessed because, you know, a lot of people try to do this stuff and they don't do it as well. But I also am very humbled and realizing where we started off and realizing it can go away any day. It's okay. But while it's going on, this is beautiful. So to be able to do things like that, for people that I love, my mom, my mom being first and foremost, mm. that person. Now I've done things with my husband, some other family members too, but that that would be my proudest yes. moment, you know. Yeah. And I and I and I thank copywriting for yeah. giving me that opportunity to do that for my mom. Carlene, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate well, thank, it. Thank you for being diligent with me. I'm sorry it took so long, you know, to get it done. It but was I'm glad phenomenal.